Uh, okay, so enjoy the fact that uh, the second lab report's not due until we do the third lab. So there's that extra week in there. Yeah, I would enjoy that if I were you. Because after that, I don't, I don't think we're going to have that kind of break anymore. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so yesterday we started st talking about waves, right? And the natural place to start with waves, this is done in introductory physics, is uh, strings. Um, and by a string here, we mean a, small, a string with small amplitude and small slope. And in that case, we derived this, uh, this is the standard wave equation. It depends upon one parameter, and that parameter is this, uh, we call it lowercase c, it's the square root of the tension divided by the density. And we saw it towards the end yesterday that this is the speed of waves, this c right here. And you'll notice, I'll be emphasizing this as we go on in this course and in the next course, you'll notice here it's the uh, square root of a stiffness, some kind of stiffness divided by some kind of inertia. And that's that's always the case as far as I know. No matter what kind of mechanical waves you're talking about, it's going to be some kind of stiffness divided by some kind of inertia. The greater the stiffness, the greater the speed. The greater the inertia, it slows up, right? This is very common here. Uh, okay, so we talked about, we, we considered a sinusoid just to get a feel for what's going on. But it turns out any, um, any function of CT, any smooth function, because we've got to, you know, to, for this to verify, to, to this to uh, satisfy the wave equation has to be twice differentiable, right? But, so if it has that smooth, I just call that smooth, any function of CT minus X any smooth function is a solution to the wave equation. And the sign doesn't matter here, so we, we, we can have another solution like this. And because it's linear, we can superpose them. And this turns out to be the uh, one form of the general, the standard general solution for a string. And we saw yesterday this is a right traveling wave and this is a left traveling wave. So where we ended was, right, we showed for our Sinusoid here, you know, it's a cosine, but it, again, it doesn't matter, like I said yesterday, whether it's a cosine or a sine or any phase in between. We can add an arbitrary phase constant here. It's not going to change anything, what we did here. We found that um, every point on this wave moves with the speed c. Okay, we focused on the crest here, but it, what we did applies equally to any, any point on the wave. And now the next step here is to notice this fact that the speed of a point on the wave, like the speed of a crest or a trough or a zero crossing or anywhere in between, is the fact that it's equal to c. Does it depend upon the wave being a sinusoid? No, that, there's no assumption of that in here. Just look at it. We never you know, we just did this to, to, to feel better about it because we naturally consider sinusoids when we talk about waves, right? But there's no assumption here of this particular shape, this particular waveform. So we would expect it to be true in general, and we can easily prove that. In fact, it's easier to prove that than I think to go through this. <laughs> Sometimes that happens when you look at things more generally. Sometimes a proof can be easier. Um, we're going to consider, a, let's consider a pure traveling wave in the, in the right direction. This applies equally to the, for a left traveling wave. So we have any function of this variable here, ct minus x, any smooth function of that is a solution, represents a right traveling wave. And we want to know what the wave speed is. So what is the, how do we, what does that mean, the speed of a wave? Well, you have to, Focus your attention on one point of the wave, for example, a crest or a trough, and look at the motion of that crest or that trough. That's what we mean when we talk about the speed of a wave. We're looking at a point of, some people say, constant phase, okay? But it's a point of constant displacement, for example, a maximum here. We can track that. We can see how fast that moves. So, 
if we're going to follow a point of constant displacement, this quantity is going to have to be constant. So that then y is, is constant. So as time goes on, you can see that x is going to have to increase. So that this, we maintain this constant. So we just set this quantity equal, this quantity equal to a constant. So that means at one time, and at, for some initial point, let's say the, a, like up here, a crest, but it doesn't matter, this value of the argument here has to have the same value at a later time if we're following the point on, a point on the wave. And that's what we want to do here because we want to get the wave speed. And now you can probably do this in your head. I skipped steps here, but if you think about it, you can solve for the change in x over the change in time, and it's just c. And of course, this applies equally to a left traveling wave. It's just that the velocity is negative, right? It's no going this way. So this is a general proof for a string here, any waveform here, that satisfies the wave equation, right? Um, so we have to have small amplitudes and small slopes. Every point, you can see this doesn't, it doesn't matter what point we choose here. Every point travels with the same speed. So the, the, the waveform propagates undistorted, undistorted. And this is a property of the wave equation and not all wave equations have that property. Like ocean waves we talked about, right? Incidentally, ocean waves do have that property but the, the wavelength has to be large compared to the depth. And then they become, you can show, although it's not done here in the physics department, except in the nonlinear course, we talk about this. Um, so you can show that ocean waves, when the wavelength becomes sufficiently large compared to the depth, you, you, in that limit, you have the wave equation. And in fact, that's what, uh, there are certain kinds of waves that have that property. What are they? I actually mentioned them yesterday. Swell. Hmm? Swell. You see. Well, yeah, but swell can still, on the deep ocean, Swell, swell having a wavelength, it can be, yeah. But I think, I, I don't really know, you know, I don't, I don't pay much attention to the ocean. You know. <laughs> but um, what's the, it has to be a very long wavelength, right, to be substantially greater than the depth. But there are waves that have very long wavelengths and they can do a lot of, tsunamis. Tsunamis tend to have very large wavelengths. So they actually become solutions to the, you can estimate their, solutions of the wave equation. And you can calculate their speed and it's huge. Can't remember the numbers. Okay, any, any questions any, or any other comments? So I, I might as well tell you, since some of you, we'll get into this more deeply later. These are called uh, non-dispersive waves or dispersionless waves. We use the word dispersion when the speed depends upon the wavelengths. And why do they use that? There's actually two historical reasons. But suppose we have a, a pulse here, we have a string, we have a pulse here, moving this way. Okay, here's this infinite string. We know that this is, com from Fourier analysis, we know that this is composed of different wavelengths or different frequencies, right? If those different components move at different speeds, what's gonna happen to this pulse? Like yes, no, that's, that's okay, that's correct. It's not going to look like this. So what's it going to do eventually? Well, these components are moving at different speeds. This is going to eventually, it, for short times it can do weird things, but eventually it's going to spread out. It's going to disperse, right? So we don't have to worry about that right now for our dispersionless or non-dispersive waves. But gravity waves, these are waves Gravity waves is used to describe waves on the ocean, although it's in competition now with gravitational radiation, right? There's a lot of news on that. Right. So, but when people say gravity waves, they usually mean waves on the ocean, where gravity is the restoring force. Those are dispersive waves, so they're more, more complicated. Um, okay, oh, so here's an... Here's an example. Here's a, a right traveling pulse. Okay, it's only a function of ct minus x. So this is a pure right traveling wave. There is no left.
traveling component here. It's purely right traveling. And here it is at one time. At some later time, it's going to be over here. And um, every, every point on the waves moves with speed c. So the crest moves, or the leading, if there's a well-defined leading edge here, it will also travel at the speed c. So this is, travels undistorted. And you can calculate where it's going to be at some later time. You just multiply the time difference by the speed, speed of the wave speed here. So let's demonstrate this. Now, this is, um, this is a, a torsional wave apparatus. And should I turn on the lights? Would that help? Yeah, maybe we should. Now, um, you see there's a steel, a, a pretty, uh, um, it's actually square steel rod going down here. Pretty small thickness. Everybody see that? So if I have a, a rod like that and I take one end and I go like this, what's going to happen? I'm going to send a wave out. We call those, we can call them torsional waves. Okay? That's one way we can, one thing we can call them. And um, they turn out to satisfy the wave equation. We're actually going to do an experiment on those. That'll be part of, the torsional waves will be part of an experiment. That'll be the final experiment where we have a bar and you will be actually driving, not with your hands, but electromagnetically will be driving this in and you will see standing torsional waves. You'll also see longitudinal waves. A bar can go like this, right? And then what's the other thing a bar can do? You can do these transverse waves, which we call flexural waves, because the bar is flexing. You'll, you'll investigate all three of those types of waves. The torsional waves have the properties that they satisfy the wave equation, right? So, somebody had the clever idea, and it, so how do you see them? There are two problems there. First of all, you've got to be able to image that motion. Second of all, and most of you will have a intuitive feel for this. Typical rod like this, you go like, if you go like this, the thing goes very fast. The wave speed is very fast. So you can see what somebody did here. They put these cross arms on here. They were notched and they fit nicely because of the square rod and they were welded or something here. And this is old and it's, you can see it's missing some rods and it's been abused. Not that much by me, but other professors. It's the way they are. <laughs> but I have to admit, sometimes, you know, when you're in a hurry, right? Um, so what's the purpose of those cross rods? It slows down. Oh, yeah, big time. It slows down the wave big time. So let's demonstrate. I'm going to generate a pulse here. Um, I can do it. Well, I can do it from over here. Okay, so what you saw there was a torsional wave pulse. It's very much like this. It's very much like this. And it travels down. That's an upright pulse. There's a, I can do an inverted pulse. And what everybody's wondering right now is <laughs> what's going on here, right? Does this look familiar? <laughs> yeah, so this is, they really do exist. This is a crude one. They're, um, other ones can be uh, highly machined, very tight tolerances. This is really crude. It's got water. There's water inside here, and then there's a disc, and it's a, you can see it's attached here. And it's serving to damp out the. It's cut, uh, cutting down, cuts, cuts down the reflections a lot. So we're going to talk a lot more about this later on in this chapter. But for right now, I'm just going to utilize it here because I don't want to. I don't want to deal with reflections. Okay. Um, so this was a clever idea. It was developed in the late 50s, early 1960s. And I'll bet none of you know what motivated it. And this is true. I'm not making this up. It was the Cold War. Believe it or not. Okay, a lot of people got very concerned with, you know, the Russians with nuclear weapons that, uh, about a lot of things. Okay, and one of them was the Russian kids are learning more than our kids, and we're going to pay. A, we could pay a very heavy price for that 
right? So a lot of people got, a lot of money was dumped into education. A lot of people who were well-known researchers, world-class researchers, actually spent time working on educational projects. Amazing time. And this was part of that. It was developed as part of that. Yeah, those were the days. Actually, there's sort of a similar thing going on now with all the STEM research, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. It's kind of a roughly similar thing. Uh, okay, so anybody, does anybody have any questions about, uh, let me see if I'm missing something here. Right, okay, any questions about this? So we're, this will be brought out again, okay, when we get more into this, to the damper here. And we have another apparatus that has arms that are one half the length. And you can join the two together and then you can see what happens when a wave is in one medium and then it abruptly hits another medium. The other medium has a greater speed of same type of steel torsional rod but less inertia. So it has a greater speed of waves. So we can look at re reflection and transmission in that case. That'll actually be that might be next quarter, I, I can't remember. Okay, so we have this, we've stated that this is the general solution. Um, the superposition of any right traveling wave and any left traveling wave. And often, what, what, you know, we, we at least want to be, often what we're interested in is a unique solution. We've got some problems, a string subject to some influences and we want a unique solution. So there's obviously an, inf a, an infinite number of possible solutions here. How does it come down to be unique? Well, um, initial conditions play a role, but before that, in the case of waves, we really should talk about boundary conditions. So that will narrow down the possibilities here, as you'll see. So um, there are two simple boundary conditions for strings, a fixed, so we're going to consider a semi-infinite string now. This goes off to infinity and it's, this is, there's no string to the left of x equals zero. So the two simple conditions are a fixed boundary condition, so this means that at x equals zero for all time there's no displacement, that's what this means. Another case is a free, we call it a free boundary condition. This is fixed, this is free. And for this you want to imagine there's this massless, frictionless ring here. And the string is attached to it. And the string is going to have to have zero slope for all time. And why is that? Anybody? Think about what's going on here. Think Newton's second law. The, f the force on the ring the ring is, you know, is restricted to moving transverse here. So F, and if I have F is equal to ma, what's m? Mass zero. Mass yeah, it's the mass, which is zero here. Okay. So can I have any, if I have a net force on this ring, a net force, net transverse force, what kind of acceleration is it going to have? Infinite. So in a practical sense, what that means is, for a very lightweight ring here and with no friction, if you did have a situation where the string came, had some slope, non-zero slope here, this would very quickly react to get down to zero slope because it has very little mass and, and, you know, and very, little, very little dissipation, damping, very little friction here. So the boundary condition has to be that the the tension force is acting right there. What's counteracting the tension force? Well, there's going to be a normal force here. We can't have any force on that ring. It's massless, okay? Or, you know, from a practical viewpoint, the, the net force could, it could be, has to be very small because its mass is very small. So that's the boundary condition. We would write it mathematically like this. The, the derivative of y with respect to x evaluated at x equals zero. Incidentally, I've seen students do this. There's an implied order here. You first have to differentiate and then set x equals zero because what happens if you do it in reverse order? 
it's going to be zero no matter what the function is, okay? So you could have a slope here. If I set x equals zero, and then I go in and differentiate with respect to x, there's not going to be any x's there. So I'm going to get zero no matter what the function is. So you don't, you don't commute these operations here. This, it's, it's implied here. Uh, now, these are simple boundary conditions. But people, and including, we, and we will do this later on in this chapter, in more uh, realistic cases, you can imagine more interesting boundary conditions here. For example, uh, the violin family, guitar, mandolin, or the very popular ukulele or ukulele. <laughs> I don't understand that, but they're just really popular. Have you guys noticed that? Take a lesson. There you go. <laughs> After 10 minutes, everyone's like at the same, instantly average. Oh, wow. Uh, I, I, so it's a collective thing. I'm the outlier then because I'm not average. You know, <laughs> you're, you're like a genius? It's not this class with help. That's why you became, you got into acoustic sequence is because of your interest in the equal. Yeah, I know. Okay. So anyway, uh, all these stringed instruments, they have a bridge. The, the, um, the, the string goes over, typically it's one like maybe like this. There's some kind of, and it's anchored here, so there's a, what's called a bridge here. Okay, and the string is vibrating, right? What's the, what's the point of this? Anybody know? Has anyone ever listened to just a bare string, the sound generated? It's very, it's not, it's, not, it's a very inefficient radiator. It's a di what we call a dipole radiator. We'll talk about this next quarter. You, you just, normally you just can't hear it. You gotta put your uh, ear very close to it to hear it. So this was overcome probably thousands of years ago. And how did they, what did they do? Well, they put a bridge here that's anchored in this, what's called a soundboard. So the vibrating string here vibrates this and the, the soundboard here vibrates and it's big, relatively big, you know, much bigger than this diameter of the string and it, it, that's, what, that's where the sound comes from, it comes from the soundboard. So how would you model this termination here? Ooh. Would you have to use like a best it's not going to, excuse me? The last one did it last last quarter. Don't you use like vessel functions? Well, <laughs> um, no, we need to come up with a model. We need to physically, how do we mathematically describe this boundary condition? Now, in regard to Bessel functions, they usually appear in circular geometries. We will encounter them in this class. Membranes. When we do membranes towards the end of the course, we'll encounter Bessel functions. But Michael is bringing up an interesting point. Bessel functions can actually arise in, it's like a linear case, straight, you know, line case like this. I don't know if they do here. I don't think so, but it is interesting. Bessel functions are everywhere. And they usually scare people. Everybody goes through this. They have this fear of Bessel functions. But one nice thing about acoustics is you're going to see Bessel functions. You will see them. You will map them out with a microphone in a cylindrical cavity. You'll be able to, in some sense, see Bessel functions. And that kind of removes the mystery and the fear of Bessel functions. Incidentally, Bessel, the original discovery, was not in this typical circular geometry case. It was in a case like this. It was a, it was a, um, a pendulum. He was, he was considering waves on a pendulum with a mass on the end, where the cord here was not assumed it was not massless. So that can have waves, right? That was the original motivating problem, and nobody knows about this. And the only reason I know is somebody told me when I was a graduate student, I never forgot. And I don't know how he found out. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So, um, how do we model this? Is it going to be, is it this? That's not going to get us very far, is it? If we assume this is fixed, we're not going to get, we want to, we you know, be able to have a mathematical model that connects with the fact that this is going to generate sound. So we're going to need some stiffness here. So you can imagine a spring, you know, there's going to be an equilibrium point, a spring, and because of the sound carrying away energy and energy being dissipated elsewhere, we probably want to put a dash pot on there too. So we'll be talking about this kind of modeling. These are the two, just two simple cases here. 
Uh, okay, so this is an example of boundary conditions. Then also to get a unique solution, we need to specify initial conditions. Uh, often, so in some in some cases, okay. And here's two typical examples. This comes from musical acoustics. <laughs> here's a plucked string. So at time t, we pull the string aside. You can imagine doing it this way: pull it aside, and at time t is equal to zero, we let it go. So this is going to be straight. It can't be curved because it's in equilibrium. Just just before we let it go. Um, so we're going to talk about problems like this. Here's another case. So this is like a you know guitar or harpsichord. Uh, what about this? What's this like? This is an a, a initial condition where there's initially no displacement. Instead of here, we have this displacement. But there's an initial velocity. And it's modeled typically as uniform over some segment here. So that's what happens when it hammers on a piano. You know, there are hammers in a piano. Right? I'm not talking about a digital piano. <laughs> okay? So, um, so um, but I think all of you will appreciate the fact that once you, s this is fixed, fixed. We've specified the boundary conditions here. We specified the initial conditions. These are two typical extreme kind of cases. After that, uh, you know, physics, if physics would, the whole idea of physics is we should be able to uniquely determine the motion of the string, and we can. And we'll do some problems like that, uniquely determine it. This will nail it down, the boundary conditions and the initial conditions. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, okay, so let's look at this, uh, these the boundary conditions here. Let's look at the simple, simpler case as a fixed boundary. So this means for all time, x, at x equals zero, there's no displacement. We know this is a general, so this is a general solution. So we can impose the boundary condition on the general solution. So no matter what is going on here, no matter what's coming in from infinity here, no matter how complicated it is, it will, this is the general solution. It will be described by that, and it has to have zero displacement for all time. So what that means is, if I evaluate x at, at zero, you can see that we get y1 of, and these y1 and y2 are completely independent functions. I got to get y1 of ct plus y2 of ct is equal to zero. Now, these functions here, y1 and y2, are functions of a single variable, as I've tried to emphasize before. And we can just replace this, this ct really, mathematically, we can just replace it with a dummy variable. Because it's just a function of one variable. So we've talked about this before. I'm going to call, sell this, call this C, Greek C, like we did before. So here's our condition on these two functions to satisfy the boundary condition. Okay? Now, so, so far it's not too bad, but it's going to get worse. And right here. And everybody has trouble with this, including me. But don't worry, help is on the way. We're going to be able to redo this from a very physical point of view down here. The only reason I'm showing you this is so that you'll see that what we're about to do physically here rests on it, is, is absolutely rigorous. It's mathematically precise. And here's the math, okay? So let me try to explain this to you. Um, okay, so y2, so this means we can eliminate y2. So here, in this equation here, this, this, this expression for the per total y, I'm going to replace y2 of this variable with minus y1 of the same, it's got to be the same variable. So that's what I've done right here. You see the minus sign? And I've replaced C with that. Okay, that's the solution. Okay, what, is it, what does it mean? You can see that this is a left traveling wave because it's got the minus here. Here, this is given us, so this is what we call the incident wave. This is the incident wave. Here's the reflected wave because it's traveling to the right. And we're not generating any waves. You know, there's no external influence. This is just, it's just a boundary condition. The reflected waves occur due to the boundary condition here. Um, now, if you stare at this, 
these, the incident wave and the reflected wave are going to have the same shape, but because of the minus sign, one's going to be inverted. And this actually represents the unique, this is a solution to the problem. Right? And if you feel funny about it, I, I'm right with you. I, I, I always, every time I see this, every four years or whatever it is, I always get confused by this. So let's look at this the way people normally look at it. We look at a simple example. Once you understand this simple example here, you will, you'll realize that this, this is true and then you, you'll just forget about it because this is the picture that just about everybody has. So here's the idea. It's actually kind of interesting. Here's our system, right? We have no... Um, we have a boundary here, okay? And we have an incident wave. We're going to take it to be a pulse, but it could be anything. You're, you'll see when we go through this, it could be anything. But this is the simplest disturbance that we can imagine here. An upright pulse like this. Forget this. This is making a connection with that, which I shouldn't have done. You can cross these out. It just causes confusion. Forget that. Forget them. Now, we want to know, how does this system evolve in time? We know that this is going to come in, and then there's, there's going to, this is coming in, it's not distorting, and we know that something's going, got to be going out. We want to find what that is. We want to solve for this for all time. So here's the way we can do it here, and this is a famous method. It's called the method of images. Most physicists know about it from electrostatics. That is, doesn't have anything to do with waves, does it? No, this method is very general. Some of you may have used it before, but here's the idea. It's really, it's, it's very simple. We're going to imagine that the boundary's removed, okay? And we're gonna let the string just continue out to infinity here. And then, when this wave comes in, this is the physical region, this is what we care about, right? This is all in our heads over here. Can we find a wave coming this way such that the displacement is always zero here. If we can do that, okay, we've taken the boundary out, if we can do that, we've found, a solu we found the solution to the problem. So the reason is the, soli the solution here is uniquely once we have this, we know what this disturbance is, and once we know that the boundary condition here, there is one and only one solution. If we can find a solution here by where this is always zero, that's going to be Z solution, because the solution is unique. So, this is called, this is the method of images, this is the um, image, in our case it's a pulse, an image pulse, and it's clear what we need to have here. Isn't, does everybody see this? It's got to be, first of all, it's got to be at the same distance here, the crest, that has to be the same distance, and it's got to be inverted. Because what happens when these start, when this starts to come in here, now remember there's no reflection of this, pole. this is an infinite string. So this one's just going to go right on through, this one goes right on through, and because we have a linear system, the net displacement is just the sum of the two, that's called superposition, they just superpose here. And once they start to overlap, What's the net displacement? Zero. Zero. So we've found the proper image pulse here because it gives us our boundary condition. So we solve the original problem by going to this other problem here where it's simpler, where there is no boundary but we have this image pulse. Once we know the solution here, that's going to be the solution there. So the conclusion is this pulse comes in here, it just, in our heads, because we don't have a boundary here, it just keeps going, and then it's gone. It's, on, it's, it's to the left of the physical region of interest here. And what we have left is this inverted pulse. So a pulse coming into a fixed boundary condition, it's coming in here, what goes out is the same pulse, but inverted, like this. So that's the solution to the problem, using the method of images. Now, I'm, I want to ask you a question here. What happens at the moment of time when the crest here is right at the origin? What's the displacement of the string? So a little bit after this, right? This is their starting, we're starting to get a superposition here. What happens when at the moment they're like this? What's the displacement of the string? Does that bother anybody? You know we're going to be talking about energy. And you know that this pulse has energy. 
right? So that's got energy, it, and that energy is going to be conserved. We have no dissipative, no, no dissipation going on here. So at this moment, how, it looks like we have in, zero energy. What happened to the energy? It's still transverse energy because we're assuming this the strain is uh, tension is constant, right? Oh yeah, this is a linear wave equation. So where's the energy? Well, isn't the, the transverse energy still there? It's just the, uh, the vertical energy? I don't, know, I don't know what vertical energy uh, means. I, but I think you have the right idea. Okay, at this point in time, there's no displacement. So there's no potential energy. Oh, incidentally, this, the fact that the string is stretched and it has potential, that's just a constant potential energy, the stretching, so we don't worry about that. But when I have a pulse, I've got potential energy because the string is actually stretched here. You can't deny it. Now you're going to say, uh-oh, but that, doesn't that mean the tension's going up? Well, this is a small amplitude, so, it's, so that's higher. We don't, we don't worry about that. We don't talk about that. <laughs> don't, don't, it's, uh, it's, we, it's negligible for small, in the limit of small amplitude waves. So this is going to have potential energy. Is that the only kind of energy it's going to have? No, as, I think this is what James was getting at. If you look at each element here, what's this mass element right here doing after a little bit of time? It's, this is coming, it's move, it has kinetic energy. So the pulse has potential and kinetic energy, and you know we're going to calculate it, and we are. <laughs> so how do you resolve this paradox here? This thing, at this moment, it looks like there's no energy. There's no potential energy. Do you think there's no kinetic energy? Well, there has to be, you have to conserve energy. So I'll let you think about it. If you think about this superposition at this point and, and let, it, let a little bit of time elapse, you'll see that there's a velocity distribution in the, in the, um, in the strain. And then the kinetic energy is in the velocity of the, the mass elements there. So the energy will be conserved. Energy has to be conserved. So is that its highest velocity? Pardon me? Well, the speed doesn't change, right? Okay, don't, um, there's two different velocities here. There's the wave velocity, or also called the phase velocity, and then there's the actual particle velocity. They're separate, completely separate. The wave speed is constant, but when I have a disturbance on here, the smaller amplitude I make it, the smaller the velocity is going to be. They're completely separate. So we're going to get into this, okay? But I just wanted to mention there's an interesting sort of paradox here that usually people have to confront is, you know, where'd the energy go at that moment? Well, there's no potential energy. But if you think about it, you'll see that there's going to be mass, the, mo the, motion, the mass elements there are in motion. And that c total kinetic energy there has to equal the initial energy here. The initial energy here is kinetic and potential. Yeah? We said once more, where, where's the potential energy stored in the pulse? The fact that the string is stretched. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're going to calculate that. This is just looking ahead, but there's, there is this interesting paradox here that I wanted to mention. Okay, any other questions or comments? Um, I sent out a message. Somehow pages 9 and 10 got flipped. So I fixed that and emailed it out. Gene will put on, but so anyway, we're, we're doing, the pages should, should have been in order. Uh, okay, so now let's do the free. Let's have a pulse come in for a free end. Well, you can go through the mass, here it is, and I, I don't know how you're feeling, but I don't want to do that. And I finally realized after the first time I taught this course, no, why do we have to do that? It's a little bit more difficult now because now we deal with slopes. Now the boundary condition, you see it? We just, we can understand it if we just look at this example right here. So here's our system, okay? That's our physical system of interest and we're gonna, re we're gonna go to this other system, right? Where we remove the boundary condition and we let the string become infinite. And we find an image pulse such that it, for all times, we have zero slope, because now we have this, the free case, which is zero slope. And now, it's pretty obvious, right? I'm gonna have, it's gonna be upright now. It's gonna be symmetrical, because when these overlap, I always have an, for all time, I'm gonna have an even function here. So an even function has to have zero slope. 
So as I tried to show you there. So that will enforce this, this, this is the proper image pulse, you know, equidistant, same, you know, upright, same as this pulse, just moving in the opposite direction. That's going to give us zero slope for all time. So when there's overlap here, we're going to get, in general, you get a complicated waveform. But after this one is gone, in our system it, is, it moves over here, what are we left with? The same pulse traveling in the opposite direction. Now it's upright as opposed to the inverted pulse. Now, there's also, we can look for trouble here too, right? Why do I have to have, what, why can't I have something like this when they're overlapping? So I've got this thing, why can't I have, this is a, this is a symmetric function. You know, this one's coming this way. Well, that, that's, so, let's see, how do I phrase this? Um, it, this is violating the boundary condition. So, yeah, that's right. I don't know how to say, I guess I don't know how to say this. Um, is it something to do with the superposition right in the middle there? No, hold on, let me see if I wrote, sorry. <laughs> Where are we here? Oh, here we are. Is this a possible, can this, can this, can this occur? The, and I guess you guys have told me the answer. The answer is no, this can't occur. Because the reason is, um, and I don't, I don't want you to think about, this is related to the ring and this construction we did here, but, it, but you really don't have to think about that. Just, let's just now look at our infinite string. Can you have a kink in an infinite string like that? The answer is no, and why? We've essentially went over this before, but it's a sort of more general issue here. Why can't I have a kink? Well, you can see that on this little infinitesimal mass element here, you, there's going to be a net force, right? And we have no mass. This is a differential element of the string, and, and we're going to shrink that down. It, you know, it's an infinitesimal. You can't have a finite force on an infinitesimal amount of mass. It's infinite acceleration. So you can't have a kink in a string like this. If, unless you're driving at that point. If you're driving it now, we've got another force here, right? So now we can have this force. The driving force would just have to be Here's our external driving force. Let me emphasize that like this. Now we would have equal and opposite. So we're going to do this. We're going to do this. But I just wanted to point out to you that you might wonder, why do I have to have this, you know, why, do I, why does this have to be zero slope? Well, it's a property, really, of the wave equation or the string. This is not a dr driven point. You can't have a kink. You would have infinite acceleration. So it will instantly, if you tried to arrange this, this would instantly adjust, or nearly instantly adjust, to have zero slope. Similar to our argument for the ring. Okay, so the solution uh, to the problem is, like I said, that we have the incident pulse here, and this is the reflected pulse. So I think next we want to, oh, so here's me finally realizing. Because <laughs> the math is a, it's a little abstract. I mean, I think it is. I don't know what you guys think, but we really don't, need to rely on that. It just puts it on a rigorous basis, right? The math here. But this is, um, you know, I'm fully comfortable with this description right here. And it, it's real, very picturesque, this method of images. It tells us what's going on. Okay, so let's now um, look at a reflection of a pulse. So let's take the damper or da dash pot off here. And I'm going to freeze it. So this is a fixed end, right? And here we go, here's a pulse. I, I maxed out, I hit something here, but it's, you can see it, right? So I have an upright pulse coming in and, with, and the reflected pulse is inverted. And of course it doesn't matter, I can go this way 
I can also turn, up, turn the lights. So I can have an inverted pulse coming in. What's going to happen? Uh, it's inverted from the original case. What about the free boundary condition? Uh, it happens every few years. It's a bad intersection. There's an on-ramp. Yeah, I think it's an highway. Yeah, it's, it, well, it's every like four or five years. It's not, it's not every couple of years. If that makes you feel better. <laughs> it's just bad and you know. Okay, so now what's going to happen? There's a common misconception among introductory students that when you have a fixed end, you're going to get reflections. When it's free, it's just, you're not going to get any reflection. That would violate energy conservation, wouldn't it? So let's see what happens here. Upright coming in, upright coming out, right? Just like we described. We can do it the other way too. Yeah. Uh. Oh. Okay. So there's one more thing we can do right now. So we talked about, let's say, imposing a boundary condition here for waves. Well, for you, it would be, they would be coming in this way, I guess. That's what we did before, right? And then we talked about how you look at a different system, you just take the boundary out, look at a different system, and use in, in your head, you imagine a, a, in this imaginary disturbance here that enforces the boundary condition, and then we get the solution by superposition. We can actually do that here. So I'm going to start with a pulse. Let's say an upright pulse here. I'm going to generate a similar one here. And what we should see is when they're both upright, what should we see? We should see no slope there. I don't know if this is going to be visible, but they're going to travel right through each other. Yeah, actually, you can see it pretty well. So I did the second one. This is the one that we talked, the, the second case. What we're doing now is. This is sort of our image solution, where we see that there has no slope. The other case would be what? The first case would be what? It would be this. So did you see, focus your attention? It's going to happen somewhere around there. It's going to be zero for all time, right? Okay, I got transients, you know, here. Okay, so one, two, three. Yeah, so somewhere right around there. So. Yeah, it took me a few years to realize that we could do that, incidentally. Uh, okay, does anybody have any questions? Uh, we got, let's just, let me just make some sketchy remarks. We could, we could stop here, but let's start, and get, let's get into the next section here. And again, you know this is coming. Here's something we want to be able to solve and appreciate. We have a half infinite string, half infinite string, and we drive the end. So that's what we're going to look at, and that's the natural thing to look at next here. Where there's going to be some force, it's a transverse force on this massless, frictionless ring here, and it's varying sinusoidally. That's going to be the, the interesting case for us, it's sinusoidally. And we're going to go complex right in the beginning here because we know it makes life much easier. The, the actual force is the real part of this. So again, we have some tension. The tension is constant in our approximation, right? And so is the mass per unit length because we have small displacements and small slopes. And now in this case, we make the assumption that there's nothing coming in from infinity. This is the natural assumption, but it needs to be stated here like I didn't state it here. The waves are slowly due to the fact of, of our drive. So when I switch this on, what's going to happen? Just qualitatively, what is, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to start to generate waves, right? What are they going to look like? What's the leading edge going to look like? There's going to be this sort of leading edge. What's it going to look like? It's complicated. <laughs> okay, it's always, and I'm just, I have, uh, yeah, I was just looking at that and some research that I'm doing. But normally, that's, in a sense, that's a transient. You know, the leading edge just goes off 
to infinity. What we want is the steady state motion. Once that leading edge is gone, every element of mass here is going to be going in simple harmonic motion at the same frequency as the drive. All right? And we, if you don't believe that, one way to, that you can be convinced is we're going to solve. We're going to find that that's the solution. We're going to solve for it. Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, state that as a possible solution and show that it satisfies the wave equation and the boundary conditions. So it must be the solution, because the solution has to be unique. That's the normally the way it's done here. So I've got a force here. Notice that the phase of the force has been chosen. It's the cosine omega t. So I want to be careful here. When I look at this massless, frictionless ring right here, it's going to be going at the same frequency of the drive in the steady state. But we don't know its phase relative to the force. It, we don't know that yet. So we need to be general. And how do we do that? How do we handle that? The natural way is a complex amplitude. The amplitude here, the, the, modul the, ma the magnitude tells us the actual amplitude of the response here. The, um, comple the, the fact that it's in general complex, the, phase, the complex phase here tells us the phase of this ring relative to the drive. We don't know what that is yet. We're gonna, we're gonna, we'll, we'll solve for that. Okay, so that's the idea, and we'll pick, pick this up this, uh, for here tomorrow.